right, I'm just gonna hit record and officially welcome you guys all to our virtual tasting tonight. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Miranda, I'm your Whiskey and Elmet Events Coordinator. I'm joined here by Julian White. I'm sure most of you guys pretty much know who we are. Um, as usual, microphone's off until we conclude the formal portion of the tasting. That would be awesome, thank you. And any questions or comments that you have, please just pop them into the chat box down below. I'll make sure that I relay those questions directly to David or to Jules, whoever needs to hear them and answer them. And if we don't get to them during the tasting, we will be sure to circle back to them at the end. You do have a lineup of cast strength whiskies tonight, so make sure that you grab some water and get comfortable because there's some really awesome whiskies here and some really awesome chat to go along with them. Uh, we have every whiskey tonight that you'll be tasting for sale. Uh, all of them are available right now via the Whiskey and Ailment web shop. There's about eight bottles of each that we have available online tonight. And this is the only place in Australia that you will be able to purchase them. This is a direct import and yeah, pretty excitingly Whiskey and Ailment exclusive. Uh, if you do miss out tonight though, just letting you know, we do have some for sale downstairs in the off-premise off cabinet at Whiskey and Ailment for those of you guys that are Melbourne locals. So I'm going to drop our web shop link down below now, just in case, you know, any early birds would like to have a quick look, but Apart from that, I'd like to just hand it straight over to Jules to introduce David and a little bit more about the tasting. Well, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And um, yeah, it is, um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and something we've been uh, working on for probably a bit too long, David, um, has, been, uh, has been getting all of these Chalton uh, bottles to Australia um, with all of the uh, delays in the Suez Canal and, uh, and coronavirus. Um, it's, it's taken a long time for these bottles to get here but we finally made it happen and, uh, and got them into your little juice bags and brought them out. So um, yeah, this is the first time that uh, Cholton whiskies have been uh, imported to Australia and, uh, and, and sold uh, at retail. So yeah, we're really, really lucky that David was able to find um, some um, allocation for Australia. I, I will stress that it wasn't like there was leftover. It was sort of like, well, sorry, we won't be able to uh, you know, give other, other um, parts of the world uh, a larger allocation it was that we were able to squeeze some out so we're really lucky thank you um and david um I'll, I'll hand it over to you now um it's really really real pleasure to have you on the line this morning i know you've um taken a couple of hours out of your morning to be with us this morning it's an absolute pleasure hi everyone uh, yes i'm dave from Chalton whiskey um it's the morning here in lovely sunny northern england and uh, it's lovely to be with you all so um uh, I think my aim is to kind of not natter on too much. So please, if you have any questions, whack them in the comments and I'll keep an eye on it and, and answer them as we go along. Um, and um, yeah, do we want to crack on with the um, first dram, Jules? Yeah, sure. And uh, I think um, uh, that's a fantastic way to start. I, you know, I think we've been in too many a tasting over the years that um, that goes on for 20 minutes, half an hour before you get a taste of something. So yeah, let's, let's look at the, uh, the first whiskey that you've got in front of you which um, will be the Crofton Gaya 13-year-old um, from 2007. Mm -hmm. um, now, David, would you be able to, because Chalton's a new um, brand, a new name in Australia, and while people might have seen the label out there on the internet, I don't think they know anything about the history of the label, um, the history of uh, your history in the whiskey industry, et cetera. So um, yeah. you know, while, we're, while we're having a look at the, uh, the Crofton Gaya, uh, it might be nice to, to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, uh, I think the, probably the most important thing really is that I don't really come from a background in the whiskey industry at all. I was just an enthusiast and um, I still am, amazingly. Um, I just started doing um, some whiskey tastings because I was trying to learn more about whiskey after I got very enthused early on. And um, that sort of snowballed into doing some bottling. So I did a couple of very small like cask end bottlings early on just for people who came to my tastings. And then over time that kind of um, became what it is now, which is, you know, um, you start buying casks and you can't stop uh so yeah it, i come from kind of the direction of being an enthusiast and um also because i'm a single person running this it means i can really um indulge myself uh, so what i put out is really what i'm excited about and what i would like to drink myself and um yeah and that's really more or less it i mean i try to have nice interesting labels for each release um i try to keep the prices pretty reasonable um I just look at it from like a perspective of if I was um, and just an enthusiast and Chalton Whiskey existed, I would be a fan of Chalton Whiskey. Um, so that's kind of how I try to approach it. And um, yeah, so it does tend to um, run to my particular taste, which 
lean towards kind of Highland and peated whiskies a bit more than anything else. Uh, I'm not really a big fan of kind of odd finishes or wine casks or any of that stuff. So it tends to really, um, it lines up with my personal preferences, which I think is uh, fair enough. And there's no one here to stop me. So that's the main thing. Hey, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. So <laughs> I think, uh, I think you know, saying that the 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 whiskies that you like is is great, and uh, if we like them too, then that, that's perfect. And an orthodox style of maturation as well, with the full terms and no funny finishes as well, I can definitely appreciate that. I think uh, you were telling Jules about the inception of you know Cholton whiskies, and it came seems to come from a very very natural place. Uh, when did, when did you start going to whiskey tastings? And I think it's in, in Cholton in, in Manchester. And, and how did the idea kind of brew? Uh, so I think I got into, started getting into whiskey probably around um, so six, seven years ago. And I really found that it was, it, when you first start, it's kind of overwhelming. There's, there's so much to learn, there's so much to try. And bottles of whiskey are quite expensive. So you can't go and buy like every um, distillery and try them all. And I really found it hard to find interesting tastings around here. So I just started organizing my own. And then we did a little um, cask end um, uh, bottling for just people who were regulars to that tasting. And that was the, the inception really. So there was never any particular plan to do it. It was really, um, oh, this is a really interesting and a kind of fascinating world to get into when you start looking into um, uh, how people buy casks and what, what you actually have to do and going up to warehouses in Scotland and wandering around them. It's, it's all really fascinating. And I still don't, entirely understand it and um uh that's part of the fun of it really and there's always something new to try as well once you start looking at single casks you know each one's different there's always something exciting about um trying a new cask for the first time you might get a surprise it might be a bad surprise or a good surprise but you'll never ever get bored and that's a big part of it um uh, someone's asked about Charlton as in the place and uh, yes um next door to Stratford. there you go maybe maybe dave you went to one of uh <laughs> went to one of David's tastings back in the day. <laughs> Quite possibly. Maybe. Um, so how many people were attending these these tastings and, and at what point do you go, damn, we need to buy a whole cask because we have whiskey tastings at this bar kind of often, but it doesn't, it doesn't dawn on us, you know, to start an independent bottling brand, you know, straight away. So it, it, yeah, it, it, it seems like a really big sort of gap there. How many people were att attending these tastings? Not a lot, really. I think early on it was really um, kind of about you know, a dozen or so regulars, and then we'd have a few other people who would turn up as well. So the first thing we did was um, uh, just like a cask end that I was able to get hold of. So it was something like 50 bottles worth. Uh, and even that took a little while to shift. But um, yeah, just, it kind of interested me enough that I was like, oh, okay, this is something I'd like to look into more. And I thought there was like a maybe a little niche for a very small independent bottler. Um, as in a one-man operation where it could be really much more personal. I think it's become more common now over the last few years that there are sort of more smaller bottlers popping up. Um, but yeah, at the time it seemed like a strange thing to do really. But um, yeah, um, I just found it really interesting and um, it means I've got a constant supply of whiskey for myself as well, which is always good. I mean, they say you shouldn't get high in your own supply, but um, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's easy to do, but yeah. I'm sure brewers never drink their own beer as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. No. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to um, have a little bit more of a look at this uh, Crofton gear now because, um, mm. like, I'm nosing it and thinking about the the profile of Crofton gear. Usually, it's sort of known as a, a heavily peated yeah. uh, Loch Lomond malt, and you know, on the nose, this one's really sort of fresh and creamy. Fresh, and, creamy, grassy. Yeah, that's right. And it wasn't until I tasted it that I went, okay, yeah, that the peat is there. So, I mean, it, when you're getting these casks, and do they are they being sold as Crofton gear, or is they being sold as Loch Lomond, and you have to sort of do a bit more digging in order to um, put the uh, the exact make on it? Yeah. So as you say, uh, Crofton gear is. Um, I think it's usually it is Crofton gear, not Crofton gear, but I'm not totally sure. Um, I, I'm not I'm sexual, but, um, um, yeah it usually is like one of the more heavily peated Loch Lomond malts I, I'm sure everyone here knows but Loch Lomond make um, a big variety of malts and some grains in the same premises so they, they make Inchmoan, Inchmurrin, Inchfad, Croftongi, Rosdu, Craig Lodge etc etc and um, Croftongi is supposed to be like I think the most heavily peated one uh, and yet this is uh, a very surprising cask uh, and this is why it's first up tonight you would never start with a heavily peated whiskey um, 
But this one, somehow or other, the, the peat is very much in the background. And as you say, it's a very kind of clean, fresh whiskey. Uh, it's got a creamy side to it. I think I put banana milkshake in my tasting notes on the nose. And um, you do get the peat like lurking in the background. And it's definitely there a bit more on the palate, I think, where you get some almost like kind of chocolatey notes as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the overall feeling is really kind of light, citrusy, creamy. It's a really nice kind of um, like a teeth, really, a good, good place to kind of open your palate up and start the night. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone's enjoying it. Um, I'm gonna try a little bit myself. Yeah, why not? Yeah, good, go on you. good on you, get into those 10 o'clock drams. <laughs> That's it. So I, I get the um, Nana, yeah, just reminding myself. Please feel free guys, pop your, pop your thoughts and your tasting notes in the, in the chat box down below. I know that we like seeing it. I know that Dave would appreciate seeing it as well. So please, yeah, don't, don't hold back on the tasting notes. So um, David, are you able to, um, to travel up to, um, up to Scotland at the moment to sample casks or are there restrictions still in, uh, in your area? The restrictions have just been lifted recently. So things are starting to open up. Um, weirdly, uh, I moved to um, a new bottling hall and warehouse um, just as the pandemic started. And I was due to go up and sort of supervise things and look around and make sure everything's okay. And I still haven't been. So all my casks are in a place that I have not ever been to at the moment, which is a very strange feeling. But um, yeah, things are opening up and um, I'm hoping to get up, you know, during the course of the summer. Um, I've been missing going up to Scotland quite a lot. So me too. Um, it's been it's been a couple of years. Well, it feels like a couple of years now since we've got to Scotland. It's quite it's quite an undertaking when when um, people from our part of the world go to Scotland. But um, I tell you what, I can't wait to get back there. It's yeah. going to be, it's, it's first on the list. I'm not going to Bali or anything. I'm going oh, to Scotland. Oh, no, definitely. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've got a trip that I was meant to go on last March that is still just postponed. The key word, guys, postponed, not cancelled. It's yeah, happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening. Exactly right. Where, whereabouts are your casks stored at the moment? You were saying, sorry, David. Uh, it's at um, um, uh, Dal Swinton lot, um, um, Bond, which is a, a newish Bond. So it's... Um, uh, traditional Dunnage warehousing, which is a rarity in um, in the whiskey world these days. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of it in, in a rack warehouse, but most of it will be in Dunnage, which is, um, if you've been around a Dunnage warehouse, um, it, it is like the traditional um, feeling of um, a whiskey warehouse. You know, you've got casks piled up on the floor, earthen walls, uh, it's cold, it's damp, uh, it smells wonderful. Um, but, you know, 95% of whiskey in Scotland is, is now matured in racked warehouses, which are just like any any warehouse really with the cast going up to the ceiling in racks and you know you have to get a forklift to get things down um so it's much more kind of romance with with dunnage you know you can just wander around and look at the casks and and you know touch them uh you'd have to wear a hard hat and um, watch out for forklifts behind you so yeah it's, it's up there at the moment but um like i say i haven't been which is um uh really strange well as soon as, soon as you get down there you have to be sure to send us some photos because that sounds beautiful yeah, there's actually um, um, facilities for having um, tastings and accommodation on site as well. So um, uh, at some point, it'd be really great to do kind of a Charlton warehouse tasting. Yeah, a bit of a virtual tour. You can count us in. Yeah, sign us up. Yeah. I'll, I'll, be in, I'll be in for that for sure. Okay, uh, book your were, flights now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> David, you were saying before that you, you had um, oh, your, uh, your older um, Loch Lomond cask for a while, but with this cask, did you have this one? Um, maturing for a while before you before you had it bottled and and you know when you bought it were you sort of had, did you have in mind how long you wanted to sit on it for before you got it bottled or was there an end game inside or yeah I'm interested to hear about how long you, you held on to it for. I think I had this for a couple of years uh, before it was bottled um, I think that the reason for bottling it um, now or a little while ago now this is this is all in slightly in the past for me in, in a weird way um, uh, I think it's got a freshness to it, which just wouldn't really be improved by a lot of age. Um, it, it's kind of got its uh, cleanliness to it and um, it just works. I mean, I was slightly wondering about waiting until it was 14 years old just to avoid the connotation with 13, but I thought that seemed silly. Um, so yeah, I just think it works really nicely at this age and um, it's paired with um, something you'll get in your next delivery, which is um, a 13 year old inch fad. Um, so they, they, they came at the same time. And that's really like a really interesting comparison because that one is genuinely heavily peated, uh, and um, you know even uh, that's more like you expect. It's more like an Isla style uh, malt. This is a bit of an oddity, really, that it, it's so um, 
yeah, it, it's so not what you'd expect from a heavily peated single malt. So it's uh, it's lovely. It's it's the creaminess. I can't I can't get over that. It's just sort of like if you could smoke ice cream, then you know it would be oh, like that. Yes. Wouldn't it? Yeah. We've had some um, some notes come in from Paul Citrus and Vanilla, and and Dom Jones is saying oddly enough, mint slice. I like that one. Mm. Also, this hmm. might be a can of worms that you want to answer at a later date, but Michael Segrave and so was everyone, I'm pretty sure, was wondering about the ideas around the label art, those beautiful labels. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, th this series, so uh, my intention's always been to have um, a label for each whiskey release, which is, um, um, may over the years start to become a bit of a millstone possibly. But yeah, I like the idea of having, it's a single cask bottling, uh, it's a one-off, so it should have some kind of one-off art with it, I think. Uh, and um, I will be kind of moving between different series of, of label art as we go along. So um, nothing will kind of be around for more than probably a year or so, and I'll switch to something new. Uh, this series, um, uh, the ones you've got there, um, is, is all uh, medieval art, which is um, illustrations um, to do with have, leaving a, leading a healthy and happy life. Um, and I thought that seemed incredibly appropriate for um, this started just at the time the pandemic was coming in, really. So it seemed like a good time to be starting to think about, um, yeah, how can, how can you lead a healthy life? And um, yeah, this I think that's it's something I'm just like quite interested in is, is sort of medieval and early modern art. So it's something that um, I'm sort of aware of. And a few of these things I've had like, the ideas floating around for years and years, like in the back of my mind thinking, oh, at some point I'll do something with these. Um, yeah, so that's the idea behind them, yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I, that's great. At first, I thought they might have been um, botanical studies because they all feature like trees, yeah, uh, or vines. And I thought it might have been about how to cook the how to cook the fruit or how to cook the vegetables. Yeah. Um, I think some of them are. Yeah, um, it, it, they tend to have a lot of nature in them because if, if you talk about medieval people, early modern people, what they thought leading a healthy life was, it was like leading a life in sort of harmony with nature, really. And um, that's that's something we could think about as well. And it's been something to think about during lockdown and um, during quarantine. So it just seemed like a very appropriate juncture to be thinking about these things. And I suppose if you're um, wondering about like a global pestilence and the medieval people knew about that. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that's the idea. That's, that's brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, I think with that, do you want to move on to our second whiskey? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, now Jules and I couldn't really help ourselves when, when we were, when we got the initial shipment, we did Pop the top off one of these quite early and oh my goodness <laughs> amazing <laughs> yeah we, we, you're meant to it, it, david in australia you have to put on um the, the stickers on the back to say um how many standard drinks according to the australian regulations there are and um the the idea is that you're meant to have those stickers on before you know within the next sort of like 48 hours after or like very soon after um the bottles land in australia and um we, we kind of just cracked one open straight away to be honest with you and uh, and got into it because i've been i've been dying to try this particular bottling and i know i know a couple of the people that are tuned in tonight as well um have been dying to get their hands on this one so um yeah we we were looking forward to it i could tell you that so whiskey number two the glenn lossie glenn lossie 27 years old ex hogshead 51.2 percent the magic 50 ah Whoa. it's around that yeah, so um, I absolutely I agree with you that these early 90s Glen Lossies are amazing and I'd really wanted to have one for a while. So it's something I've been on the hunt for. Um, I, I just think it's they're sensational and I think they're still underrated a little bit as well. I think these like 92, 93 Glen Lossies are kind of like um, 96 Ben Nevises and like it's kind of a golden year for them. Um, and yeah, they, they, they kind of need this amount of time really, I think. Uh, one thing I'll definitely say about this one is that I don't tend to sort of give people directions about um, adding water or things like that, but this is a whiskey where I really would advise trying it with some water and without, because uh, it really opens up. It's one of those whiskeys where uh, it kind of transforms from being you know, really good to being like, wow, just with a few drops of water. So um, just, just try it both ways, I would say. Uh, but it's got that kind of, um, I think when, when space like whiskey start going up to around the 30 year mark, they start to get what I call a kind of beehive quality, where you start to get kind of these waxy honeyed notes going on. And um, this has definitely got that happening for sure. Um, and it's just, I think a very elegant whiskey as well. It's kind of got this um, really kind of elegant um, sort of yellow fruitiness to it. Um, there's definitely some honey going on. There's like a very floral side to it as well. 
Um, I mean, it, it's spring here and it feels really fitting for that. Um, I guess less so for um, autumn in Melbourne, but um, yeah, it's um, a lovely whiskey, I think. And um, uh, I'm really happy to have been able to bottle it. I uh, have to agree on the, uh, that it actually suits autumn just as well as it suits spring, because to me, this is all about um, that really soft green pears um, and, and those ripen in autumn um, around this area. So right. uh, the, the green pears are, is very much a, the soft pears is very much a, an autumn flavor here. And, and it really speaks to us in that, in that way. Uh, wouldn't you say so? Like, oh, definitely that. And that orchard fruit. Yeah, yeah. Or, orchard fruit and that wonderful honey characteristic you were talking about. The sweetness that this whiskey encapsulates is such a, like, it all encompassing sweetness like it's mouth numbing you feel it in your throat you feel it in your nose like it's this wonderful full almost like um uh, just a really wonderful kind of honey quality and it's so great that you said this is a you know kind of yellow whiskey because we were talking about that today yeah talking about interpreting whiskeys in different colors like you know uh, you'll get a green astringent whiskey and then you can get a, a yellow whiskey that just reminds you of like you know field flowers and sunshine and honey and this is definitely a yellow whiskey i love that <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna honey and buttercups and maybe yeah. like ye yellow plums. It's it's got that real feel to it, hasn't it? It's um, yeah, it's lovely. It's like being in a sort of nice a nice field somewhere with flowers and um, yeah, it's great. Agreed, agreed. Um, so I've got a, go for it. Yeah, I've got a question. We can yeah, let's get into those questions, please. Yeah. So Michael was just wondering, David, how you go about choosing your casks? Do you get to physically visit the distillery and have a taste of the casks and then go, I want to bottle it at X age or you know, how do you, how do you go about it? Uh, all different ways, really. Um, sometimes you can buy direct from distilleries. Sometimes it's, it's through third parties. Um, often something I've been doing is um, you can buy sometimes parcels of casks. So you'd be able to buy, say, a distillery, a distillery will offer you casks, but say you've got to buy a minimum of three or six. And so sometimes you buy sort of parcels and then share them with other bottlers or put some down for the future. Um, there's other strange things too. So I don't think anyone ever tried the, the Ben Nevis 23 year old I had a couple of years ago. Uh, that was a, uh, a chap who lives down the road from me who inherited that uh, from his father, that cask. And he got in touch and said, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, can you help me? Yeah. And I was like, I can definitely help you. Yeah. Um, and so there's all sorts of different ways, basically. Um, it, it's kind of slightly secretive and weird, but um, uh, I mean, certainly, uh, I think the question also said about, do you, do you get to try things first? And yeah, absolutely. Um, I, there's never any question of me um, buying anything that I haven't tried or, um, yeah, I'm, I try to be like incredibly selective, um, turn down most things, I would say. Um, sometimes, sometimes there's things where you just know it's going to be good and you can be a bit more blasé about it. But um, yeah, um, uh, all sorts of different ways. And um, uh, ooh, got some good tasting notes as well now, which is nice. Very right. How's that Jonathan returning to glass number one and getting some salt and vinegar chips? I love that. I just returned to glass number one and it's all like salt water taffy, that creaminess, but it has got a whack of saltiness now, hasn't it? Yeah, I think um, um, salty peat was one of my tasting notes for that first one. I think it does need a bit of time to kind of pop out at you. Um, so yeah. Ah, oh, Dom Jones with the olive oil on the oh, Glenossi. I love that note. That's olive a great oil, one. for sure. Um, not the first press either. This is like later harvest. Yes, it's not, the, it's not the green olive oil, it's like a really deep yellow olive oil. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's advanced tasting notes there. Like what, <laughs> what exact type of olive oil it is and when was it harvested? That's what you want to hear in tasting notes. <laughs> so someone said today, and you know, um, you know, we, we try all our new whiskies at the bar here every week and uh, nothing gets under the bar unless everyone's tasted it. And, um, and someone said, Oh, it tastes like um, basmati rice, and it said cooked or uncooked. I mean, <laughs> it's definitely uh, cooked rice, or something like that. No, no, no it, was, it was uncooked rice, but it was not only uncooked rice; it was from the big bulk hessian bags that you yeah. get. <laughs> it was the smell of the full bag. Yeah, don't but ask anyway. questions. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's fine. I've not heard that one before. Hessians, though, is something and a tasting though which does come up quite a lot, isn't it? Which is interesting. Yeah, definitely, it is. Um, as long as I start a chainsaw outside, I'm going to go and close the door. Hang on a minute. <laughs> go for it, David. Go for it. <laughs> uh, Tristan's agreeing with Jonathan there. Balsamic vinegar, fancy crisps. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I, obviously, yeah, we love leaving a bit of whiskey in the glass to circle back to and see how it changes. It's got a bit of old bottle effect sort of character to it. I know this is not an old bottle, but um, it has got that sort of really old school. Crepe sort paper. Of 
crepe paper and a little bit of that coppery sort of metallic character that those yeah. really old whiskies have to them. And it's, I'm sure that's something that Dr. Bill Lumsden doesn't know how to make. <laughs> you know, Mother Nature's got that one on him still. What do you reckon? I think it's a piggy bag on. <laughs> I was just going to, I was just going to say that. I think there is something about, um, like aging, which you can't replicate when you get to this sort of age, particularly hitting around the 30 mark. There's something about that, which you're never going to get in younger whiskies. Um, it's, it's just, it's not unachievable, uh, which is a lovely thing. I, um, I've been saying it to Australian whiskey distillers for a long time um, that, you know, there's, 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 there's so many parts to um, maturation and only one of them is giving character to a whiskey from the cask. There's, all, there's so much that the, the cast takes away as well. And then there's also the other part is the interactive maturation that, you know, has that sort of like X factor that we can't really quantify and we can't control mm. um, as much as we want to, whether it be, you know, outside factors of cask, you know, the, the, the entry um, ABV that we put the whiskey into the cask, the char levels, the, the temperature we store it at, the size of the cask, all that sort of thing. You can muck around that as much as you want, but I think age is only is the only way to create that sort of flavour. I agree. I think there's there's a lot to be said for um, what they call uh, wood technology, but um, yeah, <laughs> time is in time is irreplaceable, really. I think you can get a pill for wood technology. Can't you? Yeah, <laughs> I think it's called the Thea One Reactor. It's in New York. <laughs> My front door. I'll be back in just one second. No worries. You go for it. Oh, I'm stoked with this uh, Glen Mossy. Oh, Tell you what, oh, so good. Michael Segrave's added a couple of drops of water to it and getting some red apples. I love that. And that probably feeds into the cherry ripe note that Dom was getting some, some red things there. So it's not totally a, a, a yellow whiskey. That's all right. I'll take the elf. There's, um, we were saying before about, um, you know, do you get to taste the whiskey before you, you know, buy it essentially. Mm. And it's a, it's a really valid question actually, because so many, so many bottlers purchase casks on, you know, um, just the, the label alone. You know, oh, it's a 15 year old coin leash. I'll just buy it. Well, by the time the sample gets to them, they know that it would have been sold from under them. So they just, you know, kind of have to snap it up. If it's a big name, like it's, if it's a Ben Nevis or something, you're like, I'm not going to wait for a sample of that. You know, I'll just buy it. Like That's right. So the fact that, you know, David's actually getting to taste everything and reject certain casks is is a big deal and uh yeah that, it, I, I think it's uh, it's actually not cheap either um having having received a few cask samples myself of late it's um it's not a cheap exercise um receiving all of these and, and organizing them so no i i quite appreciate it yeah. i think I, I would be fair say if i saw a 15 year old pine leash i may just buy it blind because um that sounds amazing but um it wasn't a great uh, example i'll give you that yeah <laughs> yeah um, so uh, I think it actually benefits me that being such a small bottler, um, I don't have to, I don't have to do like a monthly outturn of like 20 different bottlings. So I can be a bit more selective if you're, you know, um, uh, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society or something, and you're having to put out a huge amount of stuff every month, regardless, you just have to buy stuff. Um, yeah, I, I can just, if, if, if I don't do anything for a month, it's fine. I can wait until something comes along I'm really excited about. So that's a bit of a luxury, I suppose, for me. That's how you're going to want to keep it as well. Just, you know, quality, low and slow. Uh, I definitely want to do a bit more than I'm doing now, but that's partly because um, the pandemic's really, um, really scuppered my plans for the last year, obviously, as it has with most people. Um, so I'd like to do kind of more regular releases, but never huge quantities. It's going to be really what I can cope with as a single person. And um, yeah, I think um, a little bit more, but not too much more is the idea. Yeah, I think it gives you the opportunity to be, a bit more contemplative about the, the casks that you're selecting because there's an awful lot of good casks out there but there's not an awful lot of great casks out there yeah yeah and um you know let's hope we can always hit the ladder so speaking of shall we move on to whiskey number three let's do it get on to that bunner. we have got the bunner now but a hard and a big whiskey now at bar favorite distillery 18 year old 2002 x sherry butt bottled up 53.4%. Well, if we were talking about yellow before, yeah, this you. one's more like red, purple, pink sort of uh, character, that's for sure. Always loved that that jamminess in the Benahaman Hay. Mm. And it's got this like sort of depth and richness to it that, you know, Bunahaman spirits 
pretty much always have, you know, whether it's the peated stuff, whether it's sherry cask or not. Rarely does a Blue Island come around that's not sherry cask, to be honest. But, yeah. But they always have that richness about them and that full sort of multi batch. Chewy, you want to chew on it. Yeah. Chewy, yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's what we love about Blue Island. Inherently chewy. Mm. <laughs> show you, this is um, all I have left of it. And oh, I'll well kill it. <laughs> this is a sad, sad state of affairs. Um, but yeah, the rest of it is all gone. So. Uh, yeah, so I think what I liked about this one, um, this cask, was that it is a sherry butt, but it's not had a huge, it's not like a sherry bomb at all. It's um, a bit of more subtle sherry influence. So you still got that kind of um, fresh kind of maritime quality. You get the Bunnahar and there's like a bit of sea air kind of going on here uh, before you start getting some more of those kind of dried fruity, uh, chocolatey, chewy notes you were talking about. Um, and there's a nice, a nice bit of fruit in there as well, I think. It's a kind of nice kind of, yeah, it's kind of pinky, isn't it? It's pinky ready, I think. Yeah. We got uh, red apples just in with Michael's previous comment, and right now just red, red delicious apple skins. But also a question when you're ready for it, David. Uh, Dom Arcaro says, "Love the understated sherry on this one, but also would like to know the story behind the Chilton logo." And I think so would I. Uh, yeah, um, that's um, the, the new Chilton logo, which is the, the um, crocodile. Um, that's actually a, a picture I found from um, this is slightly ironic, an exhibition about. Um, uh, the anti-alcohol movement in the 19th century uh and it's actually um, an image depicting the, the evils of alcohol uh, so it's, it's like a, an evil crocodile trying to make you drink essentially um so i have re repurposed it uh for for my own usage um so yeah that's that's the story behind that one nice Our, um if we had if we had viewers in darwin tonight they'd be loving it there's a um there's a, a newspaper in darwin and almost every day it features the front page of the of the the newspaper has a story about a crocodile um, almost every day, and it's the laughing stock of the whole like news community in Australia. So, so the crocodile is uh, is, <laughs> is well loved here. And, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, no doubt have heard of the crocodile hunter. So it's always. I am from, I am from Darwin. Oh, there we go. There perfect. you go, Peter. <laughs> and you love a bit of you love a bit of crocodile on your whiskey, no doubt. The game here, the better. I'm enjoying the whiskey. I'm not so sure about the crocodile part. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, Peter. <laughs> I shouldn't have been so confident. Unless that would happen. <laughs> Darwin Ice as well. You don't mince your words, do you? <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting involved in um, like weird Australian geopolitics I don't understand here, which is great. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. It's uh, it's it's awesome. Uh, I'm so I'm, I was just um, I was just saying uh, to a custom, to to somebody before about you know that that um the the virtual tastings um that we've been putting on have been great for sort of you know getting out of Melbourne yeah. uh, because in the past you know we 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 mostly had in person events here at the bar and and now that uh, we've got the virtual events people all around the country can uh, can try it which um, um Peter thank you so much for uh, jumping in there. It's, uh, I, made a, I made a joke about, um, about Maseratis a while ago, the cars, and said, you know, everybody would like to have a Maserati. You know, you wouldn't really buy one, though, you know. And then someone goes, hey, I work for Maserati. Yeah. Oh, no, <laughs> not again. And of course. <laughs> yeah, the joke about Maseratis is that if you can afford a Maserati, you can also afford someone to drive behind you when you go out and it's pick up the pieces that fall off it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is my, my dad owned a Maserati briefly, um, and um, it was a very brief love affair he had with it. But uh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, there you go. You've got Paul singing praises for the balance of this whiskey rich, well balanced, and with a hint of raisin. Absolutely. John Jones says some great notes here big banana caramel milkshake on the bunner. So clear to me. Good call. On Absolutely great call. Yeah, yeah the balance is, uh, is spot on. I think you're right about that. And a wonderful use of the sherry cask as well. Not dominant at all. Yeah, I definitely, I'm not a huge fan of like big uh, sherry bombs where it's just like sherry is all you get. I, I don't really like that. So this is, this to me is kind of perfect where it's really, you, the spirit character comes through really strongly, but you've got that bit of richness uh, and that's, I think, absolutely perfect. So this was um, uh, my Christmas release for last year. So it fits, I think it fits really well with that season. Oh, it, it hits the... The Christmas uh, vibes right on the head, I think. Mean, Definitely yeah. does. Yeah, you've got that sorted. Sure. Well done. I love it. Um, all right. Well, 
I mean, that brings us to the halfway point. That brings us to halfway point. Is it break time? Does anyone need a? a I'm just going to switch to gallery view at the moment. And if anybody would like a brief intermission, just put your thumbs up. But if you'd like to just keep drinking, stay as you are. All right. Looks like we're just going to power through. That's usually the consensus. I love it. You're in the comfort of your own homes. I mean, what do we really need an intermission for anyway, guys? Just get up if you need to get up. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Not a problem. So with that, I'm going to pop a cap on my butter, revisit that one later, and let's move on to whiskey number four, shall we? Please, let's have a look. Uh, this is one of the ones I haven't tried yet. So um, I have to say, like, Highland Park for me is really, there just seems to be so many single casks of Highland Park getting around at the moment that I'm, like, apprehensive about, you know, the next one. There's, oh, there's an, always another Highland Park coming out. You know, under all sorts of, you know, whether it's called Whitlaw or whether it's called Secret Orkney or whatever it's it might be. Funky finish on it, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. it. And I, I kind of, I'm really, yeah, apprehensive about them, but I'm looking forward to this one, especially if you know, after the Buna Haven that was so, you know, evenly balanced. It'll be, uh, it'll be great to try it. And it's the uh, the classic UK hundred proof as well. There you go. Mm -hmm. We've been called. So out. yeah, this is this is actually. I mean, I, I know what you mean exactly about um, how many. Orkneys there are around at the moment. This is an interesting one though. This is um, a bit unusual, I would say. It's got a real um, big, almost sort of savory funkiness to it, which is really interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. It's got a lot of body. Uh, it's almost kind of um, syrupy. There's like a cough syrup thing happening with it. It's waxy, it's oily. Um, it's got this almost, like I say, savory um, umami side to it, which is really distinctive. Um, and it's got a load of kind of like red fruits in there as well. It is not actually your typical um, Orkney bottling, I don't think. So um, uh, do what you think. Oh, you, you, you're dead right. Um, it's got that really interesting balance, that fantastic balance that's hard to find of, um, of peat and sherry. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. It, there's, there's this sort of dance between, you know, being smoky and being you know, that that fresh red sherry character. And this one's just sort of, that they've come together and they're dancing together, which is really cool. I like that. This is actually bourbon. Um, there you go. Yeah, I know, but it, it's, um, it, it really comes across as being almost sherry, I think. It's got that sort of savory sherry quality to it, but it is, again, it's a t it's um, interesting that this is um, uh, uh, just a standard hogshead and yet the color on it is quite intense. Uh, it's an interesting cast. Something interesting's happened here with this cast, which is great. Um, yeah, I, I like the tasting notes we're getting. Um, honey and Stilton, soy sauce, sauteed mushrooms. Um, yeah, I agree with all that. And then you've got this really kind of deep um, red fruit fruitiness to it as well uh, in the taste, which is, it's an interesting combination. Um, it's, um, we're this is a slight oddity, I think, this one. It really works, I think. People were talking about, um, about bubble gum before and it's like grape soda. And that's usually a sherry cask specific note, but I'm getting that off of the nose in, in staves and this is a bourbon cast that's just really thrown me for a loop. Yeah, totally. Wouldn't have picked it for a bourbon. No. I think there's also, um, the, the peats may be slightly more pronounced than this and it tends to be with some Highland Parks. There's um, almost a kind of medicinal peaty side at the, at the finish, um, almost like an Isla um, style peatiness at the back end. It's not like your typical sort of light, heather smoky peat you get with Highland Park, which is what the cliche is. This is a bit more, um, medicinal, a bit more coastal, maybe. Um, yeah, it's like an interesting kind of aberration from Highland Park. Uh, this would probably never make it into an official bottling from them, uh, which is which is why it's great as a single cask. Why do you think it wouldn't make it into an official bottling? Because to me, it's, it doesn't quite match up with their normal releases. I don't think it's slightly an odd one, um, but yeah. Okay, all right. And and do you know where was this one lying and maturing? You know in a coastal or, you know, island location, because to me, it is so evocative of the, uh, of the, those islands and, you know, perhaps not, like, where was it? Um, I'm trying to remember and I can't remember, I'm really sorry. I can't remember where it actually was. Um, one thing I'll definitely say is though that um, uh, the, the, the benefits of like coastal maturation, uh, it's, it's a lovely romantic image, but I've had some amazingly coastal drams which have been spent their entire lives in Glasgow and um you know it doesn't necessarily uh, make a difference i don't think uh it's, it's lovely to think that that's where it's been but um yeah oh no i i I'm, i completely agree with you age-old debate isn't it yeah it's an age-old debate um it's what dave broom calls a certain 
weird shit. Um, those were his turn. Those were his words. Love it. Certain weird shit that Love goes it. on that we can't control. Yeah. So um, I like that. I'll, I'll stick with that. I think that these days they're trying to call it terroir, but uh, yeah, weird shit's probably better. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, very good. Not the typical Highland Park character, which is healthier and so oh, Heather and soft smoke. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Dave. Getting that strange medicinal coastal smoke instead of that, you know, Heather and like what we would call like a mainland kind of campfire style of peat smoke. It's just totally thrown me for a loop. I feel like, you know, it's got so much like um, wood sweetness on it. And that's probably where it's, you know, brought it out from, from, the, from the norm, you know, that mm. it's... And, and perhaps where that's where all the, the colours come from as well, David, is, you know, because it's quite dark. When you get a bottle of this, it, it does present quite dark. And I wonder whether it's like, a, you know, a recharge cask or, you know, something like that, new heads or whatever it might be, that's, that's really given that big burst of sweetness um, to counteract that smokiness. It's, uh, it's, quite a, it's quite anathema in that sense. One of our yeah, it, it, I remember trying this um, and uh, it wasn't what I was expecting. That was a nice thing when you do try a cask sample and it's, okay, this is, um, I don't know how old it was when I bought it, maybe sort of 12 or 13. And it's like, okay, this is a hogshead, 12 or 13 years old, Highland Park. And this was not why I expected to come out of that cask. And that's why um, I love it so much, really, because it's, um, it's something interesting and exciting and gets your palate kind of going in an odd direction, which is um, always entertaining. Really is. I love I love that from Domacaro. Still, so much of the honey wax pollen smell to me that I get when I open my beehives. But it was mm. so evocative of that one moment and that one place. That's beautiful. Um, question as well. Um, all your whiskies in this range, anyway, they say cask strength on them. Um, uh, do you? And, and you've certainly advocated for water on, on like the Glen Lossy, but um, you know. Is, is the idea that people will add water themselves or do you think, would you ever bottle a whiskey that, you know, you'd added water to because, you know, it was fantastic um, with a little bit of water in it? I think um, um, the philosophy is really to do as little to it as possible. Um, so very minimal filtering, uh, just like a sort of um, very coarse mesh to get rid of any, any bits of cask. Uh, no chill filtering, natural strength, um, obviously no colouring added. Uh, so I don't think I'd be in a situation where I probably would do anything that was reduced. Um, I definitely on occasion have sort of made, like said, I really think this is better with water. There's actually one in the next outturn coming up, which really needs a drop of water in it to come alive. Um, but yeah, I don't think I would. I mean, it, it's, it's such a personal thing as well. I think with adding water that some people really never do it. Some people always do it. And I find just like whiskey to whiskey, it depends. So I don't think it's ever something I would want to be kind of prescriptive about it. Um, I mean, this one I'm drinking neat and really it's pretty high strength and, um, but it just works, I think, neat. It's kind of got that punch to it without too much harshness. It's like getting in the ocean at winter, you know, at first it's painful and then you get in and go, oh no, this is nice, yeah. <laughs> Next minute you've got a distiller's palate and you can only take things over 60%. You're like, what have I done? <laughs> yeah. New make taste normal, yeah. New yeah. make taste normal, yeah. yeah. It's white bread. <laughs> <laughs> but you're basically you're leaving it in the hands of the consumer to make their own mind up about it, which is that that's great. And that's you know, you see the likes of Hidden Spirits that have three different ranges. They'll do their natural cast strength, they'll do the 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 young rebels, and then they'll do their what the classic range where they do edit the the ABV ever so slightly just of what they believe is optimal drinking strength. And then you know the likes of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society that will just always bottle it at cask strength. Both work, both have, you know, had wide acclaim, both extremely popular. And I think there's definitely room for all of it. I think we, we've done enough tastings between us that we know that there's never any consensus on anything. There's always people who have very interesting views and distinct views. Um, I always like to do like a show of hands in the tasting, like what was your favorite one? And I really like it when it's like completely evenly split. Uh, Cause it just shows you how pe different people's palettes are. And, and that's a great thing as well. Um, I, just, I just like that, the fact people have got their own opinions and their own preferences. Um, and whiskey is such a sort of personal thing, I think that, uh, and such an intense thing as well. It's, it's, it's not unreasonable or strange that it kind of strikes people in very different ways. Mm. Uh, so I, I like all that stuff. And this is one of the great things about single casks too, is that you get that, that experience and that kind of uniqueness to everything you try. Definitely. Uh, I love that from Dom. Could strap the Orkney to my nose all night. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I think, what do, you, what do you say? We're running a perfect time. Shall we move on to the fifth whiskey we have on our lineup? Sounds fantastic. So 
I mean, so this is a lock and door? Lock and door, yeah. Yeah. Lock and door, guys. 12 years, ex bourbon barrel, 61.9%. Also, my last little bit. Oh, look at that. It's like you saved it for us or something. Uh, Did you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so for people who don't know, this is the um, uh, lost peated Bunhaven. So when Bunhaven, um, sorry, Brookladdy, apologies for someone, but happened before. Um, lost Brookladdy. Um, uh, when Brookladdy reopened um, in the early uh, sort of 20 years ago now, um, they, they started doing three different peated varieties uh, Port Charlotte, Lock and Doyle, and Octomore. And at a certain point, they decided they only really needed two. So they currently do the Port Charlotte, which is heavily peated, and the Octomore, which is ultra heavily peated. And Lock and Doyle was the one that was in between. And um, so this has become a bit of a rarity now. And I think it's actually a huge shame that they got rid of this one because um, Port Charlotte and Octomore to me have got a very distinct quality, which isn't like normal Brooklady. Uh, they're much more savory. They're much more kind of intense. And uh, this is actually, Locking Door is more like, um, it, if this doesn't sound strange, it's like a peated Brooklady. Uh, it's like a normal Brooklady, but with the addition of peat to it. So it's got that kind of clarity um that you get with Brooklady but with the additional peat so it's quite distinct from the um from the other ones in the range I think. I've got to agree that you know in, in compared to a Port Charlotte which I find more ashy whereas this is more sort of fruit and essence, yeah. sweetness plus smoke with like a bolt on of smoke whereas Port Charlotte is all about that you know smoky ashy earthy character okay. um and, and yeah exactly um, so yeah, this does, uh, this is a really good point. I've never heard it put like that before. And, um, you know, on tasting it at the, that very moment, it, it really did present that way. Yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, cause I've seen Lock and Dahl before, but I've never, I, did, I didn't know actually until tonight that that Lock and Dahl spirit was discontinued in a way, right? Yeah. I didn't know that. We still see it around, yeah. don't we? We're very lucky to still see it around, but only by independent bottlers, isn't it? That's right. I yeah. did. I did just um, forego a, a high spirits bottling of uh, oh. Lock and Doll. Um, yeah. Now I'm wishing I had it. So it's it's actually interesting that this is um, uh, more heavily peated than Port Charlotte, <laughs> but you just you would not think so at all. Uh, I, I assume it's like the cut point on the stills that the the, the spirit is being produced because it's got a much um, uh, like you say, it's not ashy, it's cleaner. Uh, it's got a medicinal side to it, I think, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but it's got it's kind of very clean, sort of sea watery, um, slightly kind of um, citrusy, like tangerine -y, I think I kind of get that sort of thing happening with it. Um, but yeah, very, very clean. That's like the big thing for me. I think I kind of put um, a smoked seawater in my tasting notes for it. It's like, it's like that transparent in a sense. Um, but yeah, and it's also, it, this is at 61.9%. Um, and I don't think you would think so, Neat. It's, it's remarkably drinkable, uh, even at that kind of absolutely crazy strength. Like drinking it at 61, like not difficult at all, really. Yeah, like, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> Loving these tasting notes that are coming in as well. Jules just wants to echo the grilled prawns on a wood fire. Absolutely. That's a great one, Reza. Yeah, really. Yeah. I've I like the Pringles before as well, actually. I, I, I know what he means. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm getting this, like, strangest tasting notes from this one but i love them like the pringles can and like banana skins fibrous banana skins as well oh yeah we've got butter butter on the barbecue from josh fabulous long finish says paul absolutely <laughs> elevated cough syrup vintage 1975 yes <laughs> lovely and Jonathan, with a great comment, that Pete translates in a different way to both Port Charlotte and Octomore, completely agree with the clean and fruity S3 comments, a bit of a hidden gem. Yeah, yeah and um, unfortunately, it's going to come to an end at some point because they aren't making it anymore. So um, buy it while you can and keep some for, for the future, I would say. Good hint. good hint. Very good hint. How did it take water, Jules? Um, I actually haven't tasted it yet, but... I think it's it will take water. I haven't actually tried it, I don't think, with water, but um, Brooklady in general likes a bit of water. I think it swims well, as they say. So I think it's probably <laughs> the same. Yeah, it does swim really well. In fact, it sort of increased the syrupy like character of it and almost like at a first, you know, first first glance made it a little bit more 
a little bit more earthy, a little bit more ashy actually than Ooh. it was before. But yeah, I like it. Really good. Really, really good. Mm. Oh, we are. So I'm, I'm just incredibly sad that this is my last remaining supply. So I'm going to eat this out for a while. That's all right. We still have some available via the Whiskey and Almond web shop. <laughs> okay. Um, That's the, the most the most um, uneconomical possible way of buying my own whiskey. <laughs> we, we, we can sort it out really, David, if, it, if, if, if you do need one, but um, okay. it, it, it might take a little while. Um, yeah, put it, on a, put it on a boat coming back to the way, you'll be fine. No, I'll put it on a plane, mate, not, not happening. <laughs> um, I was gonna ask you actually about, about that. How many, you know, which, which markets around the world are these casks going to? Like I noticed on our, uh, on our Glen Lossy, only 170 bottles. Um, look, I'll be honest with everyone, 12, 12 bottles came here. I might have opened two already. Um, so that leaves 10 to go around. Um, where, where's the rest of the, uh, where's the rest of the, the whiskeys going? Are most of them being sold in the UK? I know some are going to Hong Kong. Yeah, so I have an arrangement with, um, um, I've got some friends in Hong Kong who run the Rare Malt Shop. Um, in fact, we're doing, um, in the next outturn, there's a joint bottling with them, which is a 23 year old Ben Rinnis, which is for their um, anniversary of their shop. Uh, so a little bit goes to Hong Kong, um, a big chunk goes to the EU, um, it's become a bit harder of late to actually make that work, but um, it's still happening. Uh, yeah, the bulk's then sold in, in the UK, um, uh, yeah, but distribution in Europe, and um, yeah, so it's kind of spread around a little bit, there's not a huge amount going anywhere, really, um, and yeah, like you say, with 170 bottles of the Glen Lossy, uh, you kind of have to spread it quite thinly. Um, so yeah, so yeah, you're doing you're doing all right to get um, a couple of cases, I think. Oh no, we're we're, we're thrilled um, to be getting uh, that that much. It's uh, to be able to tell people, you know, we almost got ten percent. Um, yeah, this is pretty pretty amazing uh, to start off with. So no, we really appreciate it. It's only 120 bottles of the Orphy. Yeah, there you go. Like, so we did get yeah. into that. that Unreal. That's, that's awesome. I will, I will say that um, early on when I was getting started, um, I was kind of looking for smaller casks a lot of the time because um, when you're starting out and you're not sure you can sell things, having sort of um, a sherry butt with 600 bottles in seems like uh, a bit overwhelming. So early on when I was buying casks, I would tend to look for smaller ones that'd be more, and I kind of regret that in a sense now because now there's a bit more demand and it's hard to make them go around. But um, so I'll, I'll probably try and steer towards slightly bigger casks in the future. I have been buying some sherry butts this week, so um, there'll be um, some bigger releases coming down the pipe. These are all for the long distance future, but um, yeah, I'll try and avoid the very small casks in the future. But although if it's like as good as that Glen Lossy, I'll still buy it. <laughs> um, and are you buying, you know, if you're buying some butts this week, um, are those for, for storage for a few years? Are you buying them with the, with the vision of, of holding onto them for for a few years or, or, or buy yeah uh, I'm trying more and more to buy stock for the for the future so <clears throat> I don't ever buy kind of new make or very young casks because I want, want to try things and make sure that you know it's a good cast to be putting down for the future but yeah I'm trying to buy more young stock uh just to kind of um have have things for the future I'm think I suppose I'm thinking quite long term um uh, but you I think you have to you know this is um uh an odd business to be in where it really is everything's on long time scales that's right. Yeah, I think it's something that um, a lot of a lot of business people, you know, might take for granted. Actually, that you know, you, you might be able to buy something uh, on 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 merit alone, but there's also um, the the way that things are appreciating at the moment in value uh, and prices are uh, are going up so quickly that you know yeah. they really only become affordable to to the consumer um, if someone passes on the price of the cast they bought a few years ago. Yeah. I, I know that sounds ridiculous, but I think it is actually yeah. the way that the economy is going. Oh. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's become a bit unhealthy, really, the whiskey market. I would say that um, prices, even like the last two years for casks, have, have increased enormously. Uh, and that's a lot to do with sort of speculation as well. So there's a lot of people buying casks as investments or trying to buy them and sell onwards. And um, yeah, that's become a bit unhealthy and very unhelpful for me because it's just, it makes you know, life more difficult. Competition's fiercer for good casks uh, and prices are going up. But um, yeah, because I'm trying to do my best to kind of find the stuff that's still good value and to put down stuff for the future and hopefully ride out the current weirdness. Ride out the current weirdness. Sounds good. <laughs> it's like a Quentin Tarantino film. Oh, it's very nice. Logan for the 21st century. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and the way to put 2020 as well. That's that's, that's, that's true. Um, I, I reckon uh, I reckon I'm happy to move on to the uh, yeah. Le, 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 do you say Le Dag, David, or do you say Le Chag? Le Chag. Chag. I say Le Chag too. Me too. I <laughs> yeah. say Le Chag. Um, just quickly, I know we spoke about the labels already, but I just wanted to quickly ask who did design them? Who was your artist or did you do them yourself or someone in your ranks or? Um, so all the artwork is um, from medieval artists. Uh, and then all the actual putting, I mean, it's, it's photoshopped to some extent and played around with, um, but then all the actual design putting together is all by me. There's literally no one else here. So um, like the whole thing from like selecting casks to doing the labels, to doing um, sending out things in you know on pallets, it's all me. Uh, so it is a one-man show from start to finish. Yeah. But all credit to the um, uh, medieval chaps for doing the um, actual painting. That's amazing. They're beautiful. I, I absolutely love these labels. Yeah. Um, as, as from someone who who loves um, cartography and, and beautiful old maps. Um, yeah, these these are just gorgeous. I'm so glad you um you chose them and you've got a reason to choose them as well. Um, you know, if we were to just go sticking this sort of thing on a bottle of Australian whiskey, it wouldn't quite work, would it? You know, we'd be no, we'd right. be making it up. And uh, <laughs> so no, I, I really appreciate these and the, and the 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 synergy of the uh, of the range is really nice as well. Um, I, I I'll have to I have to bring up the uh, the one that the uh, the uh, the medieval guys. Got a little bit sort of interesting with the uh, our friends at the Master of Malt. They said, "Yeah, it's a guy walking half a dog." Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, the label does look like someone walking half a dog, and then they went, "Oh no, it's a dog coming out of the bushes." <laughs> yeah, it. it uh, there's, it's actually really interesting that um, a lot of these um, images that they would in, that appear in these sort of European medieval manuscripts were copied from. Um, Arabic and Islamic originals and if I've actually done some research where I've gone back to try and find the originals and you sort of see them being copied and copied and copied and getting a bit more abstract each time and changing a little bit each time it's kind of like um, you know sort of game of Chinese whispers where it's like each time it's copied it changes a bit so you do end up with some strange things on them sometimes. That's cool I like that that's Me like too. that's like um, you know legend actually is a rumor plus time and mm -hmm. Tom's what adds all of those little interesting parts that we go, really? Nah, that's just a, that's just a legend or it's just part of legend. <laughs> it's just the things that have been added on from the original story over hundreds and thousands of years. And yeah, I, I, like, I, I like that stuff, I yeah. like that. Well, we've got Michael already picking his favorite for the night, but we're not done yet, Michael. We've still got the Lechegg to get through. Mm. So, got your nose in there yet, Jules? Sure have. Yeah, so this is, um... Uh, Ten-year-old uh, Lechegg. Um, so this is uh, technically speaking, I guess, very similar um, to the Lock and Doll in that it's um, around the same age, probably the same sort of peat level, but it's very different. This is much kind of um, a, a dirtier style of peat. It's more savoury. Uh, some sort of seafoody stuff happening with this one. Um, some more earthiness. But it's also a really nice kind of um, slightly floral side to it as well, which I think keeps it kind of clean and light without being kind of too in your face with the umami stuff. Um, some of the checks I have had have been like, just uh, being bombarded with um, like soy sauce and um, things, but this is um, a bit of a balance to it. Um, but yeah, great personality. It's, I love these little checks. We've got this really kind of um, like distinctive coastalness to them. Um, so yeah, this is, um, uh, I think really lovely. And it's, it's also, again, another one that's very drinkable at cast strength, I think, but very different to the Lock and Doll. Bring on the dirty peat, if you oh, ask yeah. me. This is you're right when you say it's a bit more dirty. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's sort of like I've always love to refer to it as mineralic in this yeah, bar. Tarry and... Yeah, tarry. Yeah, tarry. Like uh, the bar manager here, Lockwood Watt. He's a uh, favorite taste. Oh, my favorite tasting you know, that he's ever said for a lechag or anything that's come out of Tobermory has been falling over with your mouth open on a black rock beach because you get the, wow, okay. the iron from biting the inside of your mouth. You get the sandy grittiness. It's dirty. Yeah. Salt. People here have probably heard that a thousand times before, but I love it so much. It's just perfect. I have a particular fondness for that very kind of um, dirty peaty stuff. Things like um, peated Glen Scotia, uh, peated Glen Turret. Um, I, I really, I love, uh, I really love that stuff. It's, I know it's not for everyone, but um, 
there's something so fun about it really uh it's like um, a meal in the glass in some ways you know you got a lot to chew on there absolutely it's new new Glentarrant core range has a peated in it as well i think the 10 year old which is very exciting it's going to be landing soon there's something about fancy crystal bottles though Oh. And, and really dirty peat. It just feels a little bit weird to it me. It does, doesn't it? Not cohesive, <laughs> is it? <laughs> is that the Glentoric you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I think their labels are awful, the new ones, but I, I do like, uh, I do like Glentoric, though. So uh, the, uh, the old bar manager here, um, his name was James Fairley, um, is the, the grandson of the guy that used to own the place. So we have a, we have a great, we have a great love for for Glen Turret in the you know you know in a mate's sort of you know have a bit of fun way so yeah it's big a, soft spot yeah big soft spot for Glen Turret oh there you go Paul with the SMWS code sixteen dot forty six was that um oh gosh what was that one called there was that Glen Turret that we Acme Ghost Repellent Acme Ghost Repellent was that that one maybe we're waiting for your comment Paul <laughs> <laughs> incredible matter. stuff though incredible stuff. <laughs> Barbecue, barbecue brisket. brisket yeah That's nice right. yeah yeah it was really uh, to, to answer dominic's question um i do have some rua mara casks for the future excellent oh so yeah me too, Ooh, me too. <laughs> oh, i think uh if, if if you don't mind david we might have been uh teasing the upcoming children releases earlier what do you reckon yeah. what do you reckon we give people a little sneak preview to enjoy with their last whiskey yeah um so you, you the, the interesting thing is that obviously we're we're building up a pallet to ship to australia uh so you are a bit behind really so there's, a, there's some things already set aside for you which are um just, just waiting their time so um the last out turn um, i'm just trying to remind myself we had um a 13 year old inch pad which is another heavily peated lot lomond very interesting that's that fits into that kind of peated glen turret peated glen scotia savory smoky wackiness uh, there was a 18 year old Longbourn, which is absolutely kind of classic, elegant, fruity, space side. Uh, love Longbourn, um, always got a lot of elegance to it, fantastic. I've got a 15 year old Brooklady, which is um, uh, a, a beauty if you like Brooklady, it's, it's um, kind of got everything you want from it. Uh, and then we've got the um, three brand new ones, which no one's really seen yet, which I can actually show you because they're here. Um, we have um, a uh, 10 year old uh, Cativ, which is um, Klein Leash. Uh, Klein Leash have started to become funny about using their names, so you've got to invent your own these days. Um, so, yeah, this is um, uh, Cativ is the old name for Sutherland, and it's also got Cat in it, which is the symbol of Klein Leash. So, it's 10 year old bourbon barrel Klein Leash, um, absolutely beautiful and um, like waxy, coastal, uh, sort of citrus fruit going on. It's, it's lovely. Um, Plenty is my absolute favourite distillery, so it's super cool to have something from them. Uh, we've also got a uh, 24 year old Inch Murrin, which oh. is another um, weirdo uh, Loch Lomond one. Uh, this is um, really fruity, kind of tropical fruits, um, uh, kind of um, yeah, citrusy, zingy, um, like a bit of tropical funkiness going on there. It's really nice. And then finally, we have. Um, a uh, 23 year old uh, Ben Rinnis. This is the joint bottling with the rare malt in Hong Kong. Uh, this is uh, a weirdo cask where it's supposed to be a refill hogshead, but it's more like you would get from a sherry cask or a first world bourbon. Uh, like really huge, intense, deep fruitiness, um, waxiness, oiliness. Um, it's an absolute cracker. So I would look out for that if I were you. That looks. They look fantastic. I can't wait. So excited. That Ben Reed is especially talking about that waxy oiliness. What? And also the cask, okay. super reactive, obviously, bourbon refill that you managed to get a whole bunch of colour on, which is very cool. Something strange and mysterious happened with that cask, and it's wonderful. Don't we love that? We need a certain weird shit in our lives. It's we good. do. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get those here. Um, it's uh, it's it's just the way that you know we have to work with uh, all these different suppliers that we have, and we're so lucky that we can actually get these bottles here and, and out to everyone at a, a reasonable um, price, given the uh, ridiculous taxes and distance that these whiskies have to come. So um, hopefully everyone manages to uh, you know get onto these if, if they've been looking for them. I know that there are. I've had so many retailers um, contact me to to be stocking these and I said well it's sort of like 
which was give you one or two um, <laughs> if, yeah. if we're going to be if we're going to be um, justifying you know selling it at all so um, look everyone that's on the tasting tonight you're the first people to get the opportunity to buy these um, and you know really the only opportunity because there's so few of them so um, if you do miss out however um, tonight with that I'll drop the links one more time yeah if you do miss out tonight um, there will be some in the uh, in the shop um, at the bar at whiskey and ailment for you to come and buy for takeaway um, so yeah just um, feel free like that's your backup that's your backup they'll last there a little bit longer than they will in the web store yeah and um, I think with that I'll, I'll just quickly wrap up the formal portion of our tasting because We've made it through all the whiskeys. We've got all the important information on lock. So I just want to thank all of you guys for attending tonight. And thank you so much to David Bennett for joining us live all the way from Chilton in Manchester, UK, early in the morning to taste through the whiskeys with us. Also give us a sneak preview of what's coming next. And you've been just a, a fantastic presenter. Thank you so much, David. Yeah, Thanks so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I will circle back to a couple of questions we had come in. Dom Jones, I see your question there. Um, pretty much that is... That is it for the formal portion, as I said. So feel free to switch your microphones on now and ask correct, ask questions directly to David, directly to ourselves. This is where we will open it up and just have a little bit more of a chat. I've still got all of my whiskeys here to revisit. I know I can see Jules does too. Still got half a beer to work on, so the night's not over yet. But if you do need to jump away, have some dinner, put some kids to bed, whatever it may be, you're not going to miss out on anything crucial. So thank you so much for joining us once again. All the bottle links are in there. And yeah, just cheers and, and have a great night, guys. Yeah, thanks everyone. Good night. So straight back to it though. Dom Jones, just a clarifying question and a great question at that. Were all the casks in the tasting tonight refill ex bourbon hoggies except for the bunner, or were there some first fill in the ranks? Uh, so Looking Doll and Le Chegg are bourbon barrels. <clears throat> um, the rest are all hogsheads. Uh, the Orkney is supposedly a refill hogshead, but there's no way it really is. Uh, but it was advertised as such, so I'm sure that was a first fill or something's happened to it. Uh, and then the others are all, yeah, the others are all, um, hang on a minute, was the, uh, yeah, Crofton Gee was, um, yeah, the others are all um, refill hogsheads. I couldn't remember about the Crofton Gee, but yeah. That. I've got a question here that I think might be a Jules question from Josh Newman. Uh, will future arrivals be on the Whiskey and Ailments store too, for those that are not in Victoria? Yeah, they will. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, we're, um, we're just working on um, getting a, a substantial amount of bottles to ship all at once so that we're not paying you know, sort of in excess of 15 to $20 a bottle in shipping. Um, you know, that's in the past, we used to be able to um, fly bottles over here. So they would, you know, be on sale at the same time they would be in Europe. Um, but currently um, the price of shipping, uh, oh, sorry, of air freighting bottles to Australia um, is at a staggering 1000% of the uh, price it was pre coronavirus. Um, I, I just heard a staggering a staggering figure from our friends at the um, at, at a at a local independent bottler, and they they had a pallet of five hundred bottles shipped over, um, at the staggering price of eleven thousand oh, dollars from the UK that. for five hundred bottles, which is just whew, uh, unbelievable. Um, it so <laughs> it hurts, it hurts. <laughs> so unfortunately, we being on the other side of the, of the world, we do have to wait. A little while in order to you know make it economical to get these bottles to you but um they'll certainly be coming they're coming the good news is that whiskey does keep and it can sit on a pallet for a little bit longer in scotland and it won't matter it'll get to you eventually that's <laughs> it <laughs> paul leyland we obviously know what your favorite distillery is i was wondering if you have any lafroigs in the pipeline david uh, unfortunately not. Um, I would absolutely love to have some. Um, old Laphroaig might be actually one of my favourite things in the world. Um, it's, it's hard to come by. Um, the, there are casks around, but they're very expensive. Um, so uh, I would love to, but not in the immediate future. That's all right. I think you and, uh, you and Jules and I have something in common there with our old Laphroaigs. And what, what was your comment on Laphroaigs once they've been in the bottle at a certain year for a certain amount of time, they just hit this sweet spot? I don't remember. There was, a, there was a couple, there was a Jack Weaver's and there was another Laphroaig independent that we had in and it was of a certain age and it had been bottled about six years ago each time and there was a certain quality on it that... You're right. Yeah, yeah there, there were some, um, there were some um, bottlings of Laphroaig that were, there were independent bottlings and they were, come, they were being bottled around that 2014, 2014, 20, 2014 2015 yeah. time. And they were all about that seven years old. And by the time they got to Australia, 
it was sort of 2016, 2017. So they'd been in glass for a while and been sitting around and, and, and they were just like liquid harvest of grain. They had that real like cereal forward thing, you know, um, really like toasty, toasty, roasty sort of character with that big layer of smoke over yeah. the top. Yeah, Lafroy takes bottle conditioning oh, yeah. like no other, really. I reckon you're right. It yeah. does. Dave Phillips with a great comment there. Why are so many Loch Lamont IBs this year? I guess they're just pumping it out, aren't they? <laughs> Affordable. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's a combination of um, being interesting and affordable, which is nice. Um, a lot of them are kind of, um, there's a lot of dodgy ones, to be honest, and you have to sort of be very selective in what you buy from them. Um, and the old days, Loch Lomond used to be famous for the, the bottlings they put out themselves. It was like, well, what's closest to the warehouse doors? That's what we'll put out. Um, but the, yeah, if, if you sort of nosy nose through them there's some amazing stuff there and at the moment it's still really affordable which is which is a great thing um yeah there's a lot around i mean i've got um so there's an inch in the next outturn i've got a couple of younger casks from them which will be for the future but there won't be anything else for me for a little while so um yeah it's been a little, like, little flurry of them but they're not nothing for a bit longer i have to admit uh, i like the comment about the croft and Gee, uh, strawberries and cream lollipops going back to it yeah i like that I have to admit, Dave. Um, I was um, Dave Phillips. That is that. Um, I, uh, I I remember very vividly that being in uh, Loch Lomond's distillery and looking around at the casks um, that they had maturing, and where the likes of Klein Leash will pretty much exclusively have ex bourbon refill casks, ex sherry casks in the last thirty years. Um, Loch Lomond had 20 years worth of casks that were wine casks that were all these different spirit types that with different yeast strengths mentioned on the cask and they were they you know not only had they been casked with that in mind and with that specific detail on them they had also you know been matured incredibly extensively so you know there's, there's an incredible point of difference that Loch Lomond have and also had a long time ago. You know, they, 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 they really sort of set themselves apart well before the, the rest of them, I think. It is, it is an incredibly unique distillery. I mean, in some ways, it's more like a collection of distilleries under the same roof rather than being a single distillery. Um, one thing I'll definitely say about them is that their modern production is way more consistent than their old production used to be. Uh, anything from like the last 10 years or so from them, you can almost guarantee it's going to be pretty good. Uh, whereas in the past, that was definitely not the case. There was a lot of strangeness going on before that. Um, although they've, they've made things even more complicated now. So for instance, the inch fad, they now make in three different varieties, um, which is like, why are you trying to confuse us even more? Um, you know, it's just, you've, got, you've already got like 12 different makes. Why do you need to start doing variations on them? Um, yeah, uh, a comment about the Glen Lossy got uber fruit, yeah. And also I want to echo that comment from Dom as well. Such a fantastic collection of whiskies, David. Congratulations and many thanks. This is an absolutely exceptional collection of whiskies. I haven't not enjoyed one of them. That's right. I have to. Oh, thanks very much, Dominic. If anybody would like to jump in with any comments or questions, please do feel free to take yourselves off mute now. There's only 20 of us in the chat now, so I don't think we're going to talk over each other that, that badly. Well, I was just going to say... Sorry. Sorry, David, Sorry. Sorry. It's, it's another Sorry. Dave. So your reply about the Loch Lomond is interesting because my son who loves his whiskey but doesn't have too much money, that's probably exactly the reason why he's buying and interesting a lot of their brands because it's that journey of, dis of discovery and they're all quite different, all quite good value. Um, yeah. when, when, you're, when you're talking about the older Loch Lomond, so I thought I'd just finish the night with an old Ross Dew from 94. Um, but you do take your chance. But this is quite a nice one, actually. So um, There's some great ones. Ross, Ross Dew is lovely if you get a nice old one. They're great. Yeah. But uh, there are some strange ones out there for sure. <laughs> so you just just give it a try. And sometimes it's great and sometimes it's it's OK. But um, yeah, it's good. It's interesting to say about affordable um, because I don't think many people will pay a premium for any of their brands just at the moment. So maybe it's a good time to be trying them and making that your mind. But thank you. I think so that the prices are certainly rising now as people are kind of cottoning on a little bit more. Uh, I think particularly for the peated stuff, because um, there's a lot of people out there who are looking for 
um, peated whiskies at a non kind of crazy Isla price. And this is one of the places that they're going, which is just pushing demand up for them. Yeah. So Croft, the Croft and Geese and the Inch Fads and the Inch Moans uh, are, are noticeably getting more expensive and also getting a better reputation. So this is probably a good time to be getting into, into your Loch Lomans before the crowd joins you. So I was, I was just telling Owen about the, the Croft and Gear we had tonight, and the, you might be around yours to pick up a bottle, <laughs> even without the tasting you sold on it. So well done. <laughs> I really like that there's several comments about it improving and it's coming back to the glass now. This is a problem that I always have with tastings, which is that the first dram of the night always gets a bit short shrift, I think. Um, people might need to get their eye in a little bit. And if you kind of come back to the first one of the night at the end of a tasting, I always think it's like so much better than it was when you first tried it. And I've never worked out a way of getting around that with tastings, that you always have to kind of sacrifice the first one a little bit, uh, unless you tell people to please keep half your glass back and save it for the end. Um, but yeah, does everyone find the same thing? That's... Oh, definitely. Um, you know, we, we, we almost always advocate that people don't finish them as we go, that the idea is to, is to come back and, and have yeah. another look, have a bit of perspective. You know, think of these, all six of these, as six sheets of white paper, but they're all a different shade of white. You know, if you just hold one of them up and keep the rest of them behind your back, it's going to look like white paper, right? But if you hold two of them up, you go, oh, that's a little bit different. But if you hold up six different white sheets, oh, all of a sudden you've got six different colours. I so, like that. Yeah, it's, um, it's really important to have that perspective and, 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 and to, to go back and forward. And um, yeah, really, really important. There's also a good reason for not starting with the Glenlossie tonight, because, I mean, that's the obvious place to start in a sense. It's kind of the lightest and fruitiest whiskey, but it's also the most expensive. Uh, so you don't want to kind of jump straight in with that and like not give it its full uh, its full showing. So I think you have to kind of build up to that one a little bit. Yeah. But I think that the Crop and Gee is a really nice starter. And even that's a bit unconventional. I think it's got a really nice um, kind of easygoing, clean sweetness, which is like a really good palate opener. But yeah, as, as Paul says, having a starter dram isn't a bad idea. I've sometimes considered doing that at tastings, having like some bottle of blended rubbish just to kind of say, right, everyone have this drown quickly, get your palate going, and then we'll get on with the real thing. But that seems a bit extravagant, really. The Scotch Malt Whiskey Society practiced that quite um, freely here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's definitely the argument, isn't it, for making sure you leave some of everything in your glass because some of the most fun is being able to go backwards and forwards between the different whiskies during the journey and just seeing how one changes so much over time or particularly after you're smelling one of the other whiskies it's that's the fun of it all really. and yeah the Glen Lossie, as you say is is one that really opens up with time it's it's yeah. worth coming back to after like half an hour or an hour and um, it just gets better and better it really yeah. does um and again with a bit of water as well you can play with that and um kind of get like a perfect point when it's kind of opened up and become its full potential um, yeah, that's tricky to do a, a tasting, obviously, when you're trying to move along a bit. Where have you found that point to be, David, in terms of time and water? Um, not much water, I would say, like a, a few drops of water and then maybe like half an hour, just leave it sitting and come back to it. And then it's like, it just improves and improves. And I, I quite like having a dram sort of set out on the side of an evening and just come back to it every so often. And yeah, you just kind of get something different each time. Uh, this is me being very nerdy, um, but um, I'm allowed to be, I think. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit of water, a little bit of time, and it just improves so much. Um, actually, the same is true of the, um, the new Inch Murrin as well, which is, um, uh, even though that's quite a low ABV on it, it just really needs that little bit of water, and it just kind of starts doing incredible things, and you just do need them. I think there's a lot to be said for um, having a dram on the go and then putting it down, forgetting about it for a little while, and then coming back to it and then you go, oh, you have that new realization. Mm -hmm. I think that's my favorite, my favorite dramming sort of moments is, is walking away, coming back and then going, oh, wow, yeah. It even works with the empty glass. It really does. Like forget about your empty glass for a minute, go back and notice that. You're like, oh my gosh. I don't know about I was you. just gonna say that's, that's a great technique. If there's something in um, a whiskey where you try, there's something you can smell and you can't place it. If you wait until the glass is empty the next day and smell it when it's all evaporated, you'll get it straight away. Uh, whatever that thing was, you couldn't quite place, it will pop out, out at you and you'll go, right, got it. That's, right. A, that's a great, if, you, if you're having one of those moments where you're frustrated and you're like, I can smell something and I can't quite work it out, that's the way to kind of solve that conundrum, I think. 
So there's a lot to be said for, you know, methods of tasting and, you know, you shouldn't eat anything beforehand. You shouldn't have coffee, blah, blah, blah. You should, you know, taste it in the morning when you've not had anything and then taste it after lunch as well. How do you like to taste, David? What, what's your method? What's your most preferred? Um, I know that like, people say that your palate's best in the morning and I don't think that's true in my case. I think it's better in the evening. I try to, if I'm doing tasting notes, I try to write them kind of quite late at night, actually. I don't know why that is, but um, yeah, that seems to be when, um, maybe it's also when you're more relaxed, you know, you're sort of the evening, you sort of days over. Maybe that's part of it, being able to kind of have your sort of mental space to think about it a bit. But I tend to find that's the best time. Um, although having said that, I've had all the drums with you this morning a little bit, um, just having had my breakfast and some coffee. And they've all tasted really good, so uh, maybe we should drink more in the mornings. I, uh, I have to say, you know, if I'm going to add my two cents there, um, my favourite time to taste is when I'm relaxed, which is rarely, I might add. Oh, but, sure. <laughs> it's my own fault. But um, when I'm relaxed and when I'm hungry, if I haven't eaten ah. in a long time, if I haven't eaten in a long time and I'm hungry and I'm just wanting something and I taste it, you know, that's the best time to appreciate something if you're hungry. Um, and yeah, I think that, that really, that really does it for me. It's a, my senses are heightened. You're eating it. Yeah. <laughs> and your senses are heightened. You want it more. Yeah. How do you feel about um, uh, food pairings with whiskey? Is that something you do? It's, it's not something that we try to do. Um, and like, I have some, I have some rules for it, you know, like hot food, like temperature, hot food. Um, are, are a bad idea with with um, with whiskey in my mind. Um, Chili whiskey pairing with beer and wine, though, Jules is a completely different. Uh, oh, yeah, we've done those before at your place, and they've been great. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, like, yeah, pairing whiskey and beer and pairing whiskey and wine for us are, are more 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 of a thing than Definitely. they are with with food. I, I think that yeah, it's very difficult to get whiskey and food right. I think it's very, very hard. Yeah, I agree. It's something I'm trying to do a bit more of. Um, I have done it a bit and I'm, I'm working with um, a really fantastic um, uh, chef here in Charlton, Mary Ellen McTague, who's um, got an amazing restaurant here and we've done some stuff together. And it's, it's really interesting trying to make it work and finding out what does work. There's a lot of things where you think, oh, this is gonna be a good match and it just totally fails. And other things where it, it's, you wouldn't expect it to work. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting area though and it's something i kind of like to do a bit more of i think um it, as a way of sort of making um i think whiskey needs to be slightly more acceptable for polite company in some ways uh people really see it in such a different way to wine for instance and i think if it was a, available more as kind of um a, a food pairing i think that would be, actually be really helpful um so it's something i'm just interested in uh, and then i think um uh, cheese and whiskey can work amazingly well as a, as a tasting combination but again it's tricky but it can work amazingly. That's one of the things that we do advocate here yeah. is whiskey and cheese. Um, and um, I think it, it, it ticks a few boxes. It's fatty, it's cold, and it's also not, um, not sweet, like physically sweet. I think that anything that is sweet with whiskey is, is very difficult because whiskey doesn't have any physical sort of like, or very little like sweet like actual sugars to it it's all perception of sweetness um and so therefore if you put anything that's like sugary with it the sweet the, the real sugar all of a sudden makes the whiskey taste you know the opposite of sweet all of a sudden and the alcohol becomes very powerful that's a great point you know because so often people look at the flavors that would be complementary and the things that are going to go well together but then they kind of forget oh there are these components of this food that are going to you know heighten other aspects of the whiskey like you know you can have two things that make total sense but then forget that there's actually a quality in the food that's going to make a quality in the whiskey stand out that's really not what you want to do like you know the lack of sweetness in a in a whiskey if you get a really sugary food you don't kind of consider that but you I, I don't know if I'm making total sense no, right you now, are yeah yeah, yeah. The, the fact that like whiskey sweetness is all about perception and about it's about x flavor y flavor and z flavor together those three flavors in our mind, they equal sweetness. There's no physical sugar there, but they equal sweetness. And I think that that's something that, you know, can be put with, with food that, that doesn't quite work. And the other ones that I say is hot temperature, hot food don't work because, you know, 
putting hot food in your mouth physically heats your your mouth and when you put alcohol into a hot mouth oof, all the alcohol just evaporates straight away and you go jesus is hot yeah um and obviously chili just doesn't Not work pleasant. because it's just yeah it doesn't work <laughs> there you go yeah those are my things yeah, I think the interesting um, one as, as far as like, the sweetness goes is that um, uh, the, in cheeses, when you have the sort of uh, creamier, fattier cheeses, like um, soft cheeses, and they kind of really amp up the sweetness of whiskey sometimes. And that must be something to do with that kind of the, the fat molecules or something, um, which is interesting. Oh, definitely. I, I completely agree with that. We've, um, we've worked with a local um, cheese seller here to, um, to wash Ryan's <laughs> Uh, a few cheeses in the past um, and it's it's gone really well that the cheese doesn't audibly taste of whiskey um, and I, I think that it sort of just brings it a little bit closer and you're right the oils and the fats in the cheese um, are complementary because they they give um, texture to the palate and they coat the palate um, and almost protect it from the uh, from that from the bite of the alcohol Mm. Uh, and so we can really take in the aroma a lot more. It's almost like wearing a wax jacket, you know? Yeah. Like that episode of The Simpsons with Homer in the chili eating contest when he drinks the candle. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there you go. There's, there's a Simpsons reference for everything, isn't there, in the world? <laughs> there is. Yeah, I think um, the, the absolute amazing combination, if you get like a really kind of uh, stinky French blue cheese with a really peaty Isla whiskey is one of those combinations which seems like it should be awful and is absolutely amazing. It's somehow kind of, makes both of them sweeter and cleaner um, and uh, yeah thanks Dom by the way I saw you going yeah Dom, Dom's, Dom's left but he had okay. a great time tonight he really appreciated the whiskey so we're gonna send him broke <laughs> um, I have to uh, I have to tell you David unfortunately a lot of um, French cheeses the really stinky ones they don't meet Australian food stands to be important oh they don't oh. they don't make it here um, which is dreadful news, uh, but the unfortunate truth. So we do have the equivalents that are made here, but of course they can't, we can't quite do it like the French. There's no doubt about it. Oh, that's that's a great that's a tragedy. Uh, we've got to get onto government about that one. I'll, I'll never forget the first time I stepped into a French cheese store in Paris oh, really? when I was 18, and I nearly threw up on the on the doorstep. It was that pungent. Oh, I'm jealous! <laughs> I want it. Spring Street Grocer has oh, nothing on it. I'll never forget it. Oh, no, no. I'll never forget it. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, I've never been to France. I've never been to that kind of cheese cellar. I wish I had. You'll get there. What do we say? Like, postponed, guys. It's all just postponed. Postponed. <laughs> well, um, thanks, everyone, so much. Thank you, David, for um, giving us so many hours out of your day. Um, thank you to Peter for joining in and calling me out on the Darwin calls and the crocodiles. <laughs> we really, really appreciate it. Um, to Mr. Phillips, who's been uh, bothering me about the uh, Charles and Bottlings for, for many months. Uh, we really appreciate it. To Karen and Ian, great to see you online again and great to have you in last week or the week before it was. So good to see you guys in person. And, and to Michael, of course, as always, to Chris for joining us and Claire. So good to see you guys. I'd like to just open it up really quickly again for a, a last question if anybody feels like they might have missed their chance, but please jump in now. Thank you, Michael, for your kind comment there. Dave Phillips with Talisker and Oysters. Definitely can't argue with that. Classic. All right. Well, and hey, obviously a massive, massive thank you from Whiskey and Ailment and from all of our lovely guests to the wonderful David Bennett for presenting such a fantastic tasting and sharing your whiskeys with us all the way over here in Australia. We can't wait for the next collection. Thanks very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been um, a nice, nice change having a morning spent um, drinking some whiskey. So, anytime, anytime. <laughs> Thank you very much, and we'll uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks. Final cheers. Bye, everyone. See you later. Bye bye.